You know, some six, seven hundred thousand hunters buy deer licenses every year, go after the white-tailed deer. Everybody who buys a license can hunt deer. Not so with elk in Michigan for the second year in recent history. We've had a limited elk season for 120 hunters, all drawn by a lottery. This took place the early part of December, and most hunters couldn't go. But you can. All you have to do is stay tuned. Join me, Fred Trost. It's Thursday night. We're going to take you elk hunting right here on Michigan Outdoors. Elk, the biggest of the big game in Michigan. Some of the bulls go well over six, eight hundred pounds, three to five times larger than our white-tailed deer. Hundreds of years ago, elk lived in Michigan, but with the settling and the timbering, they disappeared until recent years when they were reintroduced to the Pigeon River country in the northeastern part of the Lower Peninsula. In this one small area, they flourish and have become a problem because they have no natural enemies to trim their population. The fragile vegetation takes a beating in some places trying to keep these 500-pound creatures alive. Early in December, for the second consecutive year in recent history, the DNR has held a limited hunt to trim the herd. 120 hunters who were among the 50,000 applicants, and each applicant paid $4 for the chance, these 120 winners of the elk lottery paid $100 each for their licenses. They attended an all-day class the day before the hunt, and at this class, another drawing was held for 30 bull permits. Now, it wouldn't do much towards cutting back elk reproduction if all the hunters took bulls, so bull permits were limited. For the $100 they each paid, they received fancy licenses suitable for framing and the chance to put the most wild meat in the freezer with one shot that you can do in Michigan. The bull elk is a prize, a coveted prize that each of the hunters was excited about hunting. These hunters were literally the chosen few. Why do you want to hunt elk in Michigan? What is there that, that moves you to want to hunt elk up here? Well, it'd probably be the only chance you ever get to hunt elk in Michigan. That's how I feel about it. It's really fortunate at all that you get a chance to hunt them. Were you surprised when you got your permit? Sure was. It was really exciting. <laughs> what are you looking forward to tomorrow? Well, I hope we have a real good hunt. We seen a few cows and a couple three bulls and so it looks like we have a good promising chance. Why do you want to hunt elk in Michigan, Doug? Well, I, I, I think there's a lot of reasons but probably just as important as any is that I believe in the way uh, the conservation methods to control an uh, elk herd, this is a way to do it. I think everybody benefits this way, and I, I just think it's a good, humane way to do it. Well, we, kn we know that they have to be controlled. Mm -hmm. I live north of town here, and last year after the hunt, they did a survey, and there was 860 counted. And we think that they should harvest some of them because uh, they're beautiful, they're delicious meat, they say, and they're hard on the crops, and they, uh, they do drive deer out of the area. You've really got a big day planned tomorrow. You better believe it. <laughs> Be out there before daylight and probably out there till whatever it takes. Uh, you were one of the lucky ones. You drew a bull permit. Yes, yeah, sure did. Hey, were you kind of surprised? Yeah, I was hoping to get one. I guess everybody here was, but it, was, it just makes it that much more interesting. Better chance. You wouldn't have been sad if you'd just uh, been out to hunt cows, would you? No, I was more than happy to get the permit to hunt at all. Why do you hunt elk, Jack? Uh, the, one of the biggest challenges is that there is one of the prize animals that you'll find anywhere in the North American continent. It's a tough, it's a smart animal and uh, very cunning and uh, one of the sharpest eyes and ears as far as a spot of a human being will uh, make it that much tougher. I've hunted in the west where they'll see you half a mile away and dart back in. What? You hunt whitetails too, I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. How do they stack up? Mmm, white tails probably, I, I think they'll stack up both the same. A white tail is a, a tremendous prize regardless of what size of animal that you get, a, a buck, because uh, they are a very cunning animal, very slippery animal. But uh, this here doesn't roll around every day, and this is your big opportunity, and it's finally knocked on your door, and you got to make the most of it, and I'm really looking forward to it. I can sure tell that. Yes. Good luck. All right, thank you. <laughs> Bob Garner congratulated many of the lucky hunters and got up early on opening day to tape a large group who were hunting on the private Canada Creek Club. The members of Canada Creek were happy to have elk hunters. They rolled out the red carpet, even providing guiding service, and not for the money. No, that's not why they did it. So we're bringing the, the hunters in here because we have too many elk in here. 
And the elk are actually hurting our deer. Our cutting program in here that we have every year is a new growth comes up, the elk wipe us out. So we're trying to reduce the, the herd here on Canada Creek Ranch. And this is the best way we know how to do it is bring the public into hunt place. But we want to have a good, safe hunt. Want everybody to be extra careful. Warming up in the lodge, the hunters had their orientation at Canada Creek. Outside, the icicles were hanging like stalactites off the eaves. Nearly two feet of snow blanketed the ground. It looked like a cold, rugged day ahead. And while we prayed for snow on the opening day of deer season a month earlier, the elk hunters wished a little less had fallen on the Pigeon River country during elk season. Four-wheel drive trucks and broncos were almost a necessity. A lot of vehicles would get stuck today, and walking wasn't easy off the roads, but that's what had to be done, so the hunters hoofed it. Gary Bushell, the DNR regional wildlife biologist in northern Michigan, had some predictions and some suggestions for the hunters. Gary, I've seen a lot of different methods, really, for, for hunting elk. Some people like to take, uh, take a track. Other people go to where they've seen them using clearings and seem to set like you would deer. What do you think is the most effective way to hunt elk? I think the most effective way, Bob, that, uh, that we're hearing here today is uh, hunters that came out earlier, scouted their areas, know the habits of the elk, where they're feeding, where they're going to in the daytime and, and towards the evening, and uh, I think it's those hunters that are going to be most successful. If you were going to hunt an elk, okay, and you had an area you knew elk were frequenting, uh, what, would you, what would you look for? Are they like deer? Do they have uh, a bedding site and then a feeding site, or do they tend to bed and feed in the same areas? Well, right now they're not moving that far. Uh, they're staying within a, a relatively small area between the areas that they're, they're bedding down, resting in, and also where uh, they're feeding. And it's just a matter of scouting those areas out, uh, uh, looking for the sign, the tracks, and, and evidence of feeding, and, and go to those areas and find a good place to hunt. Could you, would you set or would you uh, try and sneak on them a little bit? Probably a combination of both, I think. Uh, I think in some of this terrain here you can move on them and anticipate where they might be going and have a chance at uh, seeing and, and uh, shooting an elk. But uh, if you have an area that uh, elk are frequenting where there's a, uh, a lot of sign of, of in and out of an area, I think you could sit there for quite a while and, and perhaps have a chance to see one. Well, perhaps setting would have been better for these hunters. They'll never get close to that big bull. <laughs> no, sir, he is gone. But here's a couple of the early successes of the morning. Notice that an elk is nothing like a deer. This little bull took six men grunting and groaning to lift it into the pickup truck. A lot of weight there. Now, here's a deer that a bow hunter took the day before the elk hunt, tiny compared to the elk, easily loaded into the truck. It looks small in comparison, doesn't it? But as one of the hunters said earlier, a deer is just as difficult to hunt, just as big a prize, although not in size. And here is successful hunter Pete Rogers from Howell. Congratulations, Pete. That, that's that's got to be, I think, the first big bull that we've seen in here today. So they've told me. When did you get this one? About 9.45 this morning. Is this your first elk you've ever taken? It's the first elk I've ever, ever taken, first time I've been elk hunting. Did you see quite a few elk today? No, this is the only one I've seen this morning. So. That was the only one, and you had the bull permit. Right on. If you'd had a cow permit, you might have felt a little left out. Well, that's beside the point. I mean, I was lucky enough to get a permit, and I feel uh, on top of the world by when I drew a bull permit. So I've I got... feel real good. <laughs> I can see that. you got to be plenty excited. In fact, are you excited enough to have this one mounted? Well, I've been thinking about it right <laughs> I mean, if I don't have the head mounted, well, I'll have the antlers mounted anyhow, but I won't waste it anyhow. I Congratulations. Mean, I think you've got plenty of good eating ahead of you. Well, I think so, too. You know, well, they tell me elk meat is real good. I mean, I've eaten moose before, so I've been fortunate enough to shoot a moose, so I mean, I know they're good eating and anyhow, so. And I know elk is even supposed to be better, so. <laughs> Well, Pete Rogers okay. and 118 well, other elk hunters will all enjoy elk meat during the coming year. Out of the 120 lucky ones, one left early because of the deep snow. The other 119 stuck it out and got their elk. This is one of the elk poles in the town of Atlanta, a little northern community that's trying to establish its claim to fame as the elk capital of Michigan. 
And as it turned out, all the hunters, for all practical purposes, filled their tags, but Gary Bouchelle said that was really a bonus. Do most of the hunters seem to be pleased with the number of elk they're seeing? I think so. Uh, I know last year the hunters saw on the average of 20, 23 elk per day. Uh, even though we have deep snow conditions in the woods, I'm sure they're still seeing elk. We haven't tallied up their observations yet, but uh, seeing elk is part of the excitement of the hunt, too. Yeah, it, it, it sure is, but you have got an awful lot of snow here. Yes, I think uh, between 20, 24 inches of snow, and in fact, we're having to uh, do some plowing to get hunters back in areas where we wish to have elk uh, harvested that would be totally inaccessible if we didn't do any plowing for them. Gary, how does this deep snow affect the elk? It doesn't bother them hardly at all. They're such a big animal that they can just move right through that. Uh, in fact, it wouldn't even be bothering deer at this time. There's no heavy crust or anything cutting into their legs or any, anything of that sort. Uh, they're, not, they're not bothered at all by it. Do they change their habits at all? I don't think so. Uh, they're able to forage, uh, dig for whatever they've been feeding on prior to the snowfall. And, and at least at this time, uh, their habits are pretty much the same. Well, their numbers have been cut back by 119 for their own good, but the herd is healthy and those 119 will more than be replaced by new calves this spring. A success story in the world of hunting in the great outdoors. This is the Pigeon River country. This is where 120 elk were removed from the herd. It'll have no effect, according to DNR biologists, on the future of this herd because they, like I said, will be replaced. But this is the only place in the state that has suitable habitat up here in this remote area called the Pigeon River Country. We have introduced moose in the Upper Peninsula. The DNR established them, and Bob Strong from the UP says it could be within eight, eight years we will want to trim some moose from that herd. Who knows? Deer thrive throughout the state. The question is, what effect will this winter have? Well, I tell you, it has been cold. We have lots of snow. There's plenty of ice on the lakes for ice anglers. But these have all posed problems because of the severity, at least right now. I hope this eases up at the first of the year. When it does, maybe you can get out on the ice, catch yourself a big fish, and make our trophy book. Let's not forget fish in our December trophy book. Here's an 11 pound, one ounce walleye that stretched 28 inches end to end. It was caught on December 19th, that was last year, casting a rapala from Lake St. Clair. Now that goes in our goes to show you department, contributed by winter angler John Tancredi from St. Clair Shores. But let's look at a few of the season's big bucks. This is Robert Bauk from Goodrich, who bagged a 10 point this year with his bow on October 6th. Lucky day for Bob two years ago on on the same day, he bagged a nine-point Pope and Young qualifier. This year's buck was taken in Genesee County. On November 7th, Dennis Haugsby from Lansing took a 10-pointer. A big boy that dressed out at 185. That's only about a third the size of some of those bull elk, though. But what a trophy. He took this in Livingston County. And on November 15th, Southern Michigan produced quite a few trophies. This 12-pointer with nine and a half inch tines. This was bagged with a shotgun by Dale Emmons from Romulus. He took it down in Jackson County. <laughs> That's a home with some big boys like this 10-pointer, also from Jackson, also opening day. George Clayton from Trenton took him at 9 in the morning. Then a little later in the season, Gary Hall from Williamston was hunting a cornfield near his home, took this big eight point. Not a qualifier for a Stroh's Big Buck Award, but worthy of recognition. And if you haven't gotten your deer yet, take heart. Late season, the big bucks are still looking for does, and if you can stand the cold, you'll have a good chance with the bow. Jerry Beck from Wallace proved it last year with this eight pointer from Menominee County. But for our Trophy Hunter of the Week, let's do something a little out of the ordinary. Let's give it to this fellow who bagged a North Country 8-point. Now, I know an 8-point isn't that big of a deal, but look at this rack from the side. Amazing, isn't it? A palmated rack. Very unusual. As Alan Wilkerson said, it has 5.5-inch pans, like a moose. <laughs> Where did deer like this come from? Well, this is from Nova Scotia. Al's a Michigan Outdoors viewer from across the border. He enjoys the show and wanted to share his rack with all of our viewers. So let's make Alan Wickerson from Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, our Michigan Outdoors Trophy Hunter of the Week. 
You know, with just a little change in the weather, we might have had a record-breaking deer season. As it were, the figures look very good. The pr preliminary data says that the uh, definitely the harvest was up this year. In the Upper Peninsula, 19,000 bucks were taken, 4,500 antlerless deer. That's 23,500 for the UP. In the Northern Lower, 67,000 bucks, and that's way up. 21,800 antlerless deer, 88,800 in the northern part of the lower. In the southern lower, and these statistics are fairly mind-boggling here, uh, 30,500 bucks taken in the southern lower, 20,200 antlerless deer, over 50,000 deer taken, first time in history in the southern lower peninsula. Totals for the year, 116,500 bucks, 46,500 antlerless deer, a total of 163,000 uh, take uh, throughout the state of Michigan. That's up 26% over last year and is the second best season in history. Also making history were you viewers who watched the Big Buck uh, Pledge Night spots and to commemorate that event, Channel 56 presented Fred Trost to Black. Fred, you have done so much for Michigan, you and your people have done so much for Michigan Public Broadcasting that there's a very special presentation we'd like to make to you right now, yeah. to you. Bill, would you come here? Bill Sheehan is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of WTVS in Detroit. Bill, Bill Sheehan, you. Fred Trost, please. Fred, uh, we have a, a plaque which uh, goes to you and it goes to your program and it goes to everybody out oh, there who's been responding this way. And it's in honor of Michigan Outdoors being the most supported program on public television in Michigan. Isn't and, that uh, something? And, and part of this... <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, folks. Part of this is because last week, December 5th, the special one-hour program, mm -hmm. plus Michigan Outdoors, the regular broadcast, raised $92,500. $92,500. That's just well, terrific. I'm this this does a couple that. of things. Number one, it uh, gives a challenge to uh, the viewers out there to try to top last week's record tonight. It also sets up a challenge for other programs to try to do as well. And it uh, says thanks to you for the terrific job that you're doing. I don't want to sound like the Emmys, but you know, the credit really goes for this black to the Michigan Outdoors staff, uh, to Strohs, to Channel 23, to Mort Neff, uh, to all of you viewers mainly. That's especially the viewers. Especially the viewers. You made it all happen. And thank you. Fred, we get letters from those viewers, too. Uh, this one comes from Ernie Marku of Black River. Uh, he says, I enjoy the show greatly, but I think it is steered mostly for the beginners. I would like to see a few shows maybe in the direction of the advanced outdoorsmen. Ernie, do you know why the advanced outdoorsmen are advanced? Because they followed the basic principles. That's why when we did the show on fly casting, I tried to show the principles of fly casting, whether it's handgun shooting, uh, deer hunting, whatever it is, I have found that the experts follow a few basic principles, and that's why they're so good. So those are the kind of things I'm going to concentrate on Michigan Outdoors. A letter from one of our Canadian viewers, too, Fred, uh, Doug Boxel. He writes, uh, I was wondering why when Fred goes fishing, he never catches any fish for the trophy book. I would think with all the fishing he does, he could catch a big one. Well, here's a photo right here. There's a, a walleye that I'm holding along with a very small sunfish. Larry Molesky is pointing to the one I caught. So I did not <laughs> catch the walleye, but that's the type of luck that I oftentimes have. Now, here's a picture, though, when I was younger. This was when I was about 12 years old uh, in Mexico. I caught a sailfish. Maybe the answer is I used up my luck when I was a kid. I don't know. We have some lucky times, that's for sure. Now, let's see if you folks can answer this question in our outdoor quiz. Most whitetail bucks lose their antlers in January. Some shed their racks in December. Which bucks lose their antlers first? In a study reported by Leonard Lee Rue III, it was found that less than 1% of whitetail bucks in Pennsylvania lost their antlers before December 1st. These were the big old trophy bucks that had done a lot of breeding. They're the deer that shed their antlers first. You know, a lot of the deer that they have in pens, the DNR keeps in pens for research, don't shed their antlers. Their antlers have to be cut off. There's some very good reasons for this in this issue of the Outdoor Digest, the last one here of 1985. Leonard Lee Rue has an article on the rut. Talks about a number of different behaviors here. And we found a deer out at the Rose Lake Wildlife Research Station that exhibited just about all he of says, these. don't push it. Watch it, Fred. <laughs> 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 
Now this deer had its antlers removed because a few years ago it was a neighborhood pet. The people were very concerned and upset because the DNR took this deer away, but with very good reason. Bucks in the fall are dangerous. Leonard Lee Rue says when their necks swell, when they get a little older and they grow those antlers, you don't want to mess with them. Watch what this deer does even when its antlers are removed. It comes up to the fence where the cameraman is. <laughs> That's what we get for taking its picture. Now this buck, normally bucks become more docile when their antlers are removed and this was taken the first part of November when this deer was in the rut. If its antlers were not removed, those antlers right there would be used to kill the does that were in the pen with it. Very ornery. Look at what it did to the fence. Now this is the, was just taped on Monday and the fence had been broken earlier in the year with the antlers removed. This buck has mashed out the fence all around his cage. Bob Garner goes up just to give it, whoops, there it goes working on Bob a little bit. The deer has calmed down in its behavior as far as being aggressive because it is getting into December. It is still looking for does. This is why it's a good time to hunt for big bucks right now. They're looking for does. They're still in the mood to rut and to mate with does but the does are not available. Most of them have made it. But you can see on this buck, look at the stiff-legged behavior. It's sniffing around to see if it can smell a doe in heat. Now, what this buck is doing, you frequently see bucks do at this time of year, especially in pens, it is urinating on its own legs, so it leaves a trail for does. Now watch what it does. It's trying to sniff where some of the does in the pen have urinated. When it finds a spot, it's gonna do what's called flemining. Flemining right there. You see how it curls its upper lip? It's trying to smell to see if that doe that left that calling card is in heat. Now that behavior right there, flemining, is what we see in this painting by Chuck Denault, On the Wind, limited edition print that won our Michigan Outdoors Artist of the Year competition two years ago. An unusual behavior. Many people wonder, what is that deer doing? Well, you just saw it right here in this painting. Uh, on the wind is something that's been a mystery to a lot of people. I'm glad we were able to see it out at Rose Lake. This may look like any other type of Swiss steak, but this is a special coating on this venison. I would say, I know I keep saying it, <laughs> this is the number one venison recipe. You'd never guess what's in it. Pam this, this time you're right, though. <laughs> oh, really? Pamela Savries, Savaries from Brighton sent us this recipe that had some strange ingredients and she swore it was the best venison recipe ever. Right. She's Spicy right. Spicy venison steak, she called it. And it is good. Kath, explain how we put this together. Oh, okay. It's like I say, it's got guacamole mix in it. Sour cream, milk. There's your guacamole mix and that's all it is. It's a package of it. Okay. You did a very good job wrapping this issue. Well, I learned in the article in the Digest that, uh, that you did make this a past difference. issue about wrapping and freezing game meat. I used freezer paper on the outside, mm -hmm. on the inside uh, like a saran wrap, glad wrap, right. handy wrap. Keeps that freezer burn away from everything in there. Well, because it keeps the air away from the meat. Right. I used to use plastic bags, Ziploc bags. Mm -hmm. Doesn't do nearly the job. No. I'm tired of freezer burned food. <laughs> yes. But this was a piece, it was labeled, by the way, Rob, Zach. Right. Zach, on opening day of this year, this was his deer that he got. I'm very proud of that, his second year in a row. And it's very tasty. I'm going to cut this into steaks and just, not real thick, we just want them like an inch thick. Very little fat in right. the meat, very little right. fell on there, not enough to make All any removed. difference. It's trimmed very, up very from, from the round. Okay, you're going to fry these and some butter. We're not going to fry them real long. We don't want them to get completely done, mm -hmm. just browned. We dip them in flour to make it like a coating. Just a simple breading with no spices, yeah? None. Absolutely none. That's what's going to amaze you. Of course, I, I cook a lot of venison just that way. Right. Just You can take it right out of the pan and eat it just like that. Even without the breading? That's right. Just butter. There. Okay. Now, that point right there where the blood is starting to come out, people leave it in two or three minutes longer. They shouldn't, Kathy. No. Nope, should nope, they? They should not. It's done right there. Turn that over for just a couple minutes on this side and... You can't beat that right there. Okay, this is the guacamole mix. There's all your spices and everything right in there. Pamela, you were 100% right. This, <laughs> she sure was. This is amazing. Going to thin it down just a little bit with some milk, because otherwise it'd, be just, it'd just stick mm -hmm, right to the pan. Thick. Right. And sour cream. And it looks like a stroganoff when it's all done. Much better than any stroganoff recipe I've ever had, though. Oh, it's... A little bit of salt and pepper, and that's all it is. Oh, look all at the that spices. bubbling. 
Right. See, the meat's already fried. Right. Now, so a little salt and pepper on there. Just simmer it, right? And you take it up anytime you want, just as long as it's mixed up good. Cooks there until it simmers and it, it comes out looking like any other type of Swiss steak, right. maybe. It's stroking off, like Look about. Said. Well, well, you, you, look at this. Look at the the plate in the middle right here. Can we see this? What Bob did while while we were talking about the recipe, Kathy? Hey, keep on talking. I'll keep eating. This is great. He cleaned it out. He took a third After of it. After his own was gone. Uh, I'll tell you what. This this very well could be. This could be. The, I like the I like the um, uh, the the type of uh, creamy sort of recipes anyway. And this one is just oh. This is dynamite. Let's let the crew share in on this. Well, they always do when the show is over. Bob left you a little bit. So we got some forks Very here. Little bit. This is outstanding. You are oh, going to love you. it. I tell you, a lot of the recipes they do, they're, they're waiting for our recipe contest in March. <laughs> they <laughs> all want to work that night. We can't get any time cues now. That, oh, we got a time cue over wrap. here. This